of this body of Christ. This is a family, a real family. Our church focuses on is connecting others to the love of Jesus. As you leave the church property, it says you're now entering the mission field. Well, good morning, church. My name is Tim McGill. I'm the minister of music here at First Baptist Millington. Psalm 126.3 says, The Lord has done great things for us, and because of this we are glad. We want you to know this morning that we serve a good God, and we're ready to sing about Him this morning. Let's stand together as we begin our worship service this morning. God be the glory. Yes. Let's praise him this morning. Let's continue to sing together.
Let's praise the Lord this morning. I hope that is your prayer, that the Lord's kingdom would come and reign in your life. You can be seated. Brother Shannon, you come. There are some of those scriptures that continue to reverberate back and forth uh, in your life. And Psalm 102 has been one of those. This week I had the opportunity to share with a friend of mine that was struggling uh, with some things uh, through this piece of scripture, through uh, this chapter. He, uh, he listened to the message that I'd preached on that, and, and, and he texted me about midnight. And I thought this may be something that, that would speak to you. He says, he said, that dude was miserable for the first 11 verses. And then he said, but you, O oh Lord, abide forever. Well, that's a word of peace in the middle of the night for a man that was struggling. God is forever. It says, your name is to all generations, and you will rise and have compassion on Zion. You will have compassion on the church. God will have compassion on us. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning, this beautiful day. We are now in spring. <laughs> Winter will be coming back soon, so don't, don't put your coat away. Let me just announce real quick this morning, in the back of your pews there are two cards. These cards are uh, prayer uh, comments and prayer requests. We get lots of these. If you've got a concern uh, on your heart and you would like for us to see those, you fill that out. You put that in the offering plate later, and we'll definitely be looking at those. And if you have a next step that you need to make, maybe you need to join the church, maybe you need to be baptized, maybe you know you or someone you know needs to talk to someone about coming to know Jesus as your personal Savior, you be sure and do that and put that in the, in the uh, offering plate in just a moment. We'll take those, and, uh, and we'll be praying for those and be looking at those. Also, there's sermon notes for later on when uh, Pastor David comes and preaches. You'll be able to take notes at the same time at the exact same time and uh, keep up with those. So if you're here online this morning, we are so glad that you are able to uh, meet with us as well. On the bottom of our website is a, uh, an email address. You're more than welcome to send us your prayer request uh, as well. We want to be able to pray for you and serve you in whatever uh, capacity that you need. Let's fellowship. Let's shake each other's hand, encourage one another, tell the person next to you that you love them and that Jesus loves them as well. Man, I love to see God's people fellowshipping together. If you would, please find your seat. You can have a seat and direct your attention to the baptistry. We're going to continue to worship through Believer's Baptism. Well, good morning. It's a wonderful day to be in the Lord's house today, and I am here in the baptistry with Miss Paisley Craig. And a couple weeks ago, her mom called me and said, I am so excited Paisley has made a decision, and she is here today to let everyone know about a decision she has made. Before we get to that, though, I want to ask if you are friends and family of Paisley's, if you would please stand up where she could see you. All right. Paisley, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? All right. I have a seat right here. I know it's deep. <laughs> Right here. <laughs> right. Here, you go. here we go. We got you. By your profession of faith, my little sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the illustration we have of being buried in our sin and God raised to a new life. And God, we just give you thanks for all that. And we've, we're so thankful that that's through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray you be with us as we continue to worship now and on through the message, God, that we open our hearts and minds, God, and just learn more about you. And God, just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. Love to see that. Monty is a... Uh grandpa up here and he couldn't wait to stand up he stood up three or four times before jason asked him to so uh we've got a new song we want to begin to learn with you all this morning it is called 
by faith. What I'd like to do is sing through the course a couple of times so you can get a hold of that course. So when we uh, come through it and you're learning those verses, you at least have the course you'll know. So listen to the praise team as we sing it once and then you join in and sing it with us that second time. This is by faith we will stand as children of the promise. We will stand as children. Because the Lord just a, a few weeks ago put Hebrews chapter 11 on my heart. And if you know this passage, it's referred to as the hall of faith. But verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 11, it goes through all of these men and women of the faith that were faithful to the Lord uh, in, in doing the work that he had called them to do. And it says in verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promise. But having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The folks in this passage were faithful even though they died before what they died before the promise had come. Christ had come in their lifetime. They continue to be faithful, but I love the part that it says, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. They weren't looking with their eyes, they were looking with their faith. And so this song is just packed with scripture, packed with what Hebrews 11 is talking about, but the course is so important because we are standing as a church saying, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we will walk by faith and not by sight. So the, the, men and women that are talked about in this passage died before the promise had come, but we have, we know the promise and his name is Jesus. We have seen what the power of the cross can do in our lives, what it continue to do to people, and we will stand as children of that promise. So let's stand together as we sing this new song this morning. You're going to catch on to the verses, but when it comes to that chorus, sing it out that we will stand as a church, as children of the promise.
That is our prayer this morning, that the Lord will use us, and then we'll stay faithful to his promise. to your 
Lord, I pray that that is us this morning, that we will give our lives into your hands for you to do what you will, and we will walk by faith and not by sight. This is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You know, there's no other place in all the world I'd rather be than worshiping at Millington First Baptist Church. Uh, as we gather together to praise the Lord and seek His face. I'm so glad that you're here and what God's going to do uh, in these coming days in the life of our church. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And as you're turning there, uh, we are going into a series of services beginning next Sunday that we call revival services. Those services are intended to be a concentrated time where we gather together to hear from the Lord. Revival means that we are asking the Lord to renew, refresh, revive us for Him, for His glory, for His purposes. Revival uh, is primarily for the saved. So if you're a believer, revival's for you. It's to revive. Vive, V-I-V, vivre in French means to live. Revive is to live again, to be renewed, to be refreshed, to be uh, born again, if you want to use a salvic term, uh, salvific term. And so these revival services are the purpose for us to draw closer to God, be challenged by Him. And so you need to make a commitment to be a part of every one of those services beginning next Sunday morning, Sunday night. Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. We're going to have a business luncheon for community leaders on Tuesday as well, and evening meals so you can come straight from work and be a part of our revival services. We want to hear from the Lord. Uh, Willie McLaren is a minister in Middle Tennessee, and he's going to be here preaching our revival services. He's a dear friend. He's an African-American brother of mine and uh, a committed follower of Jesus Christ. And so you come and be a part of each one of these revival services. In the theme of revival, I've directed our attention this morning to 2 Chronicles. Uh, you can look there. I'm going to preach on uh, chapters 28 through 32. Now, I'm not preaching till we have revival services, okay? Uh, just breathe. We're going to be okay. But we are going to talk about real revival and what that means and what it looks like from Scripture. President Franklin Delano, uh, excuse me, President Franklin Roosevelt said these words, I doubt if there is a problem, political or economic, that will not melt before the fire of spiritual awakening. Rochester, New York was dramatically transformed by the gospel work of a man by the name of Charles Finney. In 1830 and 1831, those years were called the greatest spiritual awakening in American history, and it happened under his preaching. In fact, shops were closed so people could attend his meetings, and the results of the changed hearts caused the town to be changed as taverns went out of business. Finney soon gained international fame thereafter. God did a work through a man for his glory. Some of you have heard of A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer said, if you go back and study the old time revivals, those meetings changed not only people's lives, but the community as well. There was a power that did not come from the assembly, a power that came down on that assembly, and that power was the Holy Spirit. He continues, what would happen this Sunday morning if the Holy Spirit manifested Jesus Christ in such a way that people experienced his presence? He said, I believe the kind of revival we need, that's what we need today. You see, real revival begins on the inside with a change of heart, but it quickly shows itself on the outside in a transformed life. And so today I want us to look at revival through the life of a young king named Hezekiah. 
we're first of all going to talk about the conditions before revival. And if you'll follow along with me in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, I'd like to begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do right in the sight of the Lord, as David his father had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He also made molten images for the Baals. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Beth Hinnom. And he burned, hear this, he burned his sons in fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree see prior to revival we want to see what the conditions were like and the bible tells us here in these verses that re religious idolatry was rampant in that day in fact the greatest temptation of life is to worship something other than god it, the devil really doesn't care what you worship other than god the devil just cares that you worship something other than god so for some people, they may, it may be a hobby. For others, it may be your work. For others, it could be anything in between and including those things. But anything that distracts us from the worship of Almighty God is idolatry. We live in a country today where people are worshiping powerless gods. We worship money. We worship fame. We worship hobbies. We worship notoriety. We worship Super Bowls. And Tom Brady, he's so cute. We worship things that are unworthy of our worship, and we neglect those things that are worthy of our worship. That was going on here in the Old Testament. It goes on in some degree in our lives as well. Because here's the fact, my friend. We are created by God. You didn't get here by yourself. You are the plan of an almighty God. You are not an accident. The Bible says you were made in the image of God. And because of such, being born in his image... You are to live your life for his glory. And anything else is an idol in your life. We were made to know God. We were made to love God. Now, the reality is nothing I do as a pastor is more important than you understanding you were made by God for God. What was going on here in the text is the same thing that was going on with Elijah as he encountered the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. He, he confronted a situation of spiritual perversion. The king's wife Jezebel had introduced her pagan god, and she wasn't content with just worshiping her pagan god herself. She wanted to involve other people, so she wanted to make it part of the nation's worship. She insisted that everybody worship Baal, and that desire of hers brought about the demise of a country. She led in the compromise of the worship of God until the people no longer recognized that they even had a covenant relationship with God. Baal was the Canaanite god of fertility and storm. And so the Israelites were brought away from the worship of Yahweh God to worshiping other gods as well. We would call it syncretism today. Syncretism is trying to reconcile or bring union to different and opposing principles or philosophies. They wanted to take a little bit of Baal and maybe a little bit of the covenant and maybe a little bit of Buddhism and a little bit of Confucianism, uh, a little bit of uh, Islam, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and form their own unique body of beliefs. My friend, that is no belief system at all because the Bible tells us Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You don't get to heaven by Confucius. You don't get to heaven by Buddha. You don't get to heaven by Islam. You don't get to heaven by your hobbies. You get to heaven because of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he provided for you when he died on the cross of Calvary. 
Religious idolatry is rampant in America today, but it's rampant even among those of us who call on the name of the Lord. That's why we need revival. Look there in chapter 28, verse 5. The Bible says, Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and he defeated him and carried him away, carried away from him a great number of captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. What was going on before revival was a military weakness. They had become weakened through their worship. It became diluted. Other forces began to oppress them, and not one nation came against him. Two nations came against them there in verse 5. And so there was this weakness. There was this religious idolatry that was going on. But if you look at chapter 28, verse 16, you're going to see something very sad. The Bible says, At that time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria for help. You see, before revival took place, the king Ahaz turned to the wrong sources for help. Have you ever done that? He turned to himself. He turned to the imaginations of man. He turned to his friendships with other ruling leaders. He thought that his problem here was physical, And it was going to be remedied by a physical solution. So if he could get others to join forces with him, then he would be a formidable opponent to those that would come against him. And therefore, the kingdom would move forward and everything would be okay. But that's not how it turned out. Verse 23, you can see there, For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him. So you see the thought. If they defeat me, then their God's greater than my God, so I'll just start worshiping their God, and when I worship their God, then all of a sudden they'll back off me and everything's going to be okay. But that's not how it works. You see, there comes a time when your back is going to be against the wall. And when your back is against the wall, what are you going to turn to? Are you going to turn to your friendships or your alliances? You're going to try to get out of your problem through some physical imagination or or, or the creativity of your thoughts? Or are you going to turn to God in the midst of your heartbreak and despair when your back is against the wall? You see, Ahaz did what many have done after him, and he turned to his human alliances rather than to the God of the universe. He didn't even recognize the problem for what it was. He addressed what he thought to be the problem. You may never have heard the name of Mary Anderson, but Mary Anderson was uh, riding on a streetcar in New York City in 1902. In 1902, as she's riding on the streetcar, a rainstorm came. When the rainstorm came, she noticed how chaotic the streets of New York City became. People began to, cars began to hit each other. Uh, uh, Streetcars began to run into things. And it was just a really desperate type of mad dash that was going on in the city whenever it would rain or snow. Because every driver of the streetcar, when it started to rain, had then to begin to try to wipe down the windshield in front of them with their hands so they could see through the glass so they could drive appropriately. Some of them got real creative, and rather than turning their arm outside the windshield and wiping it, instead, they stuck their head out the window. And so they're driving a streetcar down the streets of New York City with their head out the window in a driving rain trying to drive the streetcar. Multiply that by all the inhabitants of the city. You can imagine it was a chaotic mess. And so Mary decided that certainly there had to be an answer to that. And she went back home to Alabama and she hired someone to help her, a designer. And in 1903, she created a patent for the first manually operated windshield wipers. Now, they're standard on our our cars today, and we're glad for that. But Mary hit on a solution that nobody thought was a problem. In fact, Tony Fidel, the creator of iPod, 
calls this an invisible problem. It's a problem that we don't think of as a problem because we're so used to it. And because we're so used to it, we don't see it anymore. And because we don't see it anymore, we don't think about ways that it could be different or better. That's exactly what was going on in 2 Chronicles. They had an invisible problem. The king thought that the problem was physical in nature, but the reality of the problem is it was spiritual in nature. And so he has this problem, and he's trying to put the wrong solution to the problem. I have to say, it reminds me of America today. We have an invisible problem, although the symptoms are all around us. Hear me, church. We have accepted the godless society as the norm in America. We have accepted the carnality of people who call on the name of the Lord as routine in America. We speak of abortion, and that was suggested a week and a half ago by the governor of Virginia, infanticide. And we talk about it with no tears, no brokenness, no heartbreak. In America today, we speak of revival as a history lesson. We speak of revival as a spiritual theory instead of a possibility, and praise God, a reality. You see, we can find ourselves in this text if we'll look long enough. And so the conditions before revival in many ways were the same here in the Old Testament as they are today in the 21st century. Re religious idolatry, military weakness, turning to the wrong source for help. But I want you to notice, secondly, the courage of the man of God. I'm here to tell you, God always has a people. God always has a remnant. When Elijah was on Mount Carmel, he said, I'm the only one facing all the prophets of Baal. He wasn't the only one. Obadiah had told him just verses earlier that he had hidden 100 of the Lord's prophets. But when Elijah was facing the 450 prophets of Baal, he said, oh my goodness, it's just me against them. Well, he may have felt that way in the moment, certainly, but the reality was God had a people and God had preserved a people because God's purposes were going to move forward even beyond the Mount Carmel experience. Here in the text, God raised up a courageous leader named Hezekiah. He replaced Ahaz as king, and he was very different from his predecessor. In fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 10, something about this new king, Hezekiah. Look there in verse 10 of chapter 29. The Bible says, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his burning anger may be turned away from us. You see, the last king thought he had a physical problem and he tried to give it a physical solution. The next king knew that there was a spiritual problem and he attached a spiritual solution to the spiritual problem and therefore we're going to see progress being made in his life. You see, King Hezekiah understood it because he had a heart for God. He had a heart for God. A minute ago I said, told you that revival was for believers and it is. So why aren't we experiencing Revival. Maybe it's because we've allowed the world to influence the church more than the church has influenced the world. Maybe it's because the people of God have, through syncretism, begin to add things to their faith that in fact have not benefited their faith. Rather, it's made their faith lukewarm. Maybe we've been going through the motions of Christianity and not experiencing the power of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You see, what was going on in Hezekiah's heart is he came to that position of leadership with a hot heart for God. And I want to ask you something, church member. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to even ask you to testify. I'm just going to ask you to ask this question to God on your behalf. 
God, do I have a heart for you? God, do I have a heart for you? Do I have a passion for Christ and for his cause? Do I understand that I've, made, I've been made for him? And am I living that out regularly? I guess I'm asking you, where do you stand before God right now? What's, the con- what's your spiritual condition right now? Hezekiah had a heart for God and part of the courage that he possessed secondly i want you to notice he took a healthy course of action if you look there in verses three through nine of hezekiah 29 excuse me of hezekiah that's not in the bible second chronicles 29 about hezekiah there i got it right you'll see in verses three through nine that he began to bring about change in the country that was godward in its direction it wasn't godless He took a healthy course of action. You know, most of us are known by our choices, right? Good choices, bad choices, in-between choices. We're known by our choices. And when Hezekiah came to the, the, uh, the kingship of that nation, he began to lead them where his predecessor led them away from God, and he led them into polytheism. Hezekiah then led them toward righteousness and holiness and he took a healthy course of action and he asked them to consecrate themselves and consecrate the house of the Lord there in verse 5 the God of your fathers and carry the uncleanness out from the holy place you see he wanted the nation to put God back in the center where it where God belonged but God can only be restored to the center of a nation until God is restored to a place of preeminence in the life of each individual. Notice he did right in the sight of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 29, verse 2. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. You had a king in Ahaz that had not done what his father had shown. And you see now in Hezekiah, someone who followed his leadership, you see, what, let me ask you, what about you? Uh, are you taking healthy choices, moving forward and advancing the cause of Christ, the cause of righteousness in your life and in the life of those that you influence? Are you making right decisions? You see, righteousness is simply right standing before God. Our righteousness is imputed by God because of what Christ did for us on the cross. But we also carry that forward in the decisions that we make. And here we see Hezekiah, a righteous man, courageously making decisions that are going to influence others for the cause of Christ. Through one man, God moved in revival among a whole nation. That happens everywhere we look. God using men. God used Charles Finney. God used Billy Sunday. God used Billy Graham. God has used people throughout the ages that were committed to his cause to further the cause of Christ. Many of you may have never heard of the name Blasio Kugasi. He was a school teacher in in Rwanda in Central Africa. He was discouraged about the lack of vitality in his spiritual life, and he went off for a week to a prayer retreat, and he began to spend time with God, and it was there that God renewed his heart and renewed his spirit and gave him courage and gave him power. And he came home and he confessed his sin to his family and to his, uh, to his community. And then he began to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in the school where he taught. And all of a sudden, the winds of God's spirit began to whip and revival broke out there, resulting in students and teachers being saved. In fact, at the school, they called the people that were involved in the revival abaka and abaka means people on fire oh that america could look at us as believers in jesus christ and say those people are on fire because of our consecration and dedication to christ well blasio left that school and he was invited to go uh, to uganda and there in uganda He was going to speak to the Anglican church, and he began to preach just like he did when he was in Rwanda. 
and the same thing happened. The Holy Spirit of God came down on that assembly and he began to preach and people were converted and lives were changed and transformation was going to take place. And several days later, Blasio died. That doesn't seem like that's supposed to be the rest of the story. It's not the rest of the story. Because what came from his three-week ministry is known as the Great East African Revival. God used Blasio to stir up the people and God began to do a work and that work didn't affect just his life or his family's life or the Anglican church over here or his school over there. No, it impacted uh, the whole continent for the name of Jesus Christ. You see, courage is always the sign of those who God uses. Spiritually courageous. I tell folks, God can't direct a parked car. Godly men and women have spiritual initiative. They're courageous for the cause of Christ. Notice also here the corrections toward revival. Now, I'll hear in the 21st century calls for revival. Now, certainly, evidence of the need for revival is all around us. No one can deny but it begins with the people of God realigning with the Lord. What does that mean? We have to repent. We have to pray. We have to seek holiness. We have to return to God. And it is impossible to call for revival without a call for repentance. This has always been God's requirement for revival. It's been his requirement for people who call on his name. Corporate prayer has always been present in revival. And yet in the 21st century today, we curse the darkness. Yes, we do at times. But there's little evidence of brokenness that should come with it. Brokenness over the condition of our nation, but not only our nation, my friend, Brokenness because of the condition of the church. Brokenness because of the condition of our walks before a holy God. We call for revival without actually crying tears of brokenness for revival. It's almost like it's a spiritual fad. Hey, come join us for revival. Woo! Better be here Sunday through Wednesday because we're not going to be here on Thursday. I'm here to tell you if God showed up, we'd be here on Thursday. If we got right with the Lord, we'd be here on Friday. We wouldn't quickly move on to some other activity. We would just have a heart's passion to want to stand in the presence of Almighty God and say, Lord, descend on us today. We wouldn't be able to keep that to ourselves. We'd want others to know about it. I'm here to tell you, if you're without Christ, the greatest decision you could ever make is to come to Christ. And don't wait till next week. You see, we say, you need to be committed to Christ. You know, I'm not so sure we got it one off. Some of us don't need more commitment to Christ. We need more surrender to Christ. I mean, we want to double down and make it part of our daytime or part of our agenda, part of the, our iPad calendar. Uh, that's all really nice and wonderful, but my friend... God wants to transform your heart, and if he transforms your heart, he's got your calendar. Maybe we need to be, <laughs> y'all going to think I'm crazy. Maybe we ought to be a little less committed and maybe a little more surrendered. A true call for revival is first and foremost a recognition that we've departed from God. We've departed from God. But it's so easy to talk about the governor of Virginia. It's so easy to talk about those on the left coast. It's so easy to talk about those nutcases, pardon me, Lord, in seats of government. It's so easy for us to point the accusatory finger and say, man, the world is going crazy. 
And it is. It is all those things. But my friend, the greatest sin of all would be to point our finger at a lost world for acting lost when we as the people of God who are saved by the name of Jesus Christ, bought with the blood, have a reservation for heaven, continue in some of the sinful patterns and thought patterns that we have. I'm not preaching to those out there. I'm preaching to us. God wants to deal with the sin of his own. And that's where we come in. Revival demands repentance. And if you look at Hezekiah's life, you're going to see him leading that move of repentance in the nation in which he led. He began opening and repairing the doors of the temple. He was going to reestablish the worship of Yahweh God. He gathered the priests and the Levites, and he empowered them with righteous instructions. And he said, hey, go get right before God. Do your ceremonial cleaning, and then go in and clean the temple. He confessed the sins of his fathers and those who had come before him. He revealed the consequences of their sinfulness. It's all found there in 2 Chronicles 29. He inspired the religious leaders to begin to live up to their calling. You see, correction is displayed through conduct. Repentance is made known by actions, not intention. If you study these chapters, you're going to find the conduct that came from revival. And the actions indicate that there was a change of heart. They were going in a new direction toward the Lord, toward His will. So what took place? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 31. Flip over a page or so with me in your Bible. 2 Chronicles chapter 31. Look there at verse 1. Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah, broke down the pillars in pieces, cut down the ashram, and pulled down the high places and the altars throughout all Judea Judea and Benjamin, as well as Ephraim and Manasseh, until they had destroyed them all. Then all the sons of Israel returned to their cities, each to his possession. They tore down their idols. Now, in the Old Testament, that was easy to do. Easy in the sense that you could see the idol. You knew what the idol was. I mean, you saw the Asherah pole in the city center. You saw people making sacrifices to that. You saw people giving their children and burning them at the stake for sacrifice to a false god you saw that you smelled the stench of that as you walked by that place in the city center they were tangible and physical there was a household god like jacob saw pulled out from under the 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 mat or the pallet of the camel and was hidden but you knew what the idol was And when Jacob told his family that they were going to Bethel, he said, prepare yourself to meet the Lord. As part of that preparation, they took away the household idols. What does that mean? He wanted them to totally focus upon the Lord. He he wanted all distractions removed. Now, it was easy in the Old Testament to see the idol. In America today, it's not as easy to see the idol because our idols are physical. Our idols are mental. Our idols are spiritual. They're money. They're sports. They're family. They're hobbies. They're the stuff that we fill our lives with, the career for some people. And some are not just marginal pursuits, but they can even be good things that we give too much emphasis to that replaced the priority of the Lord in our life. And Jacob felt he owed his allegiance to God because God had helped him every journey of the way. Revival was being evidenced because of the removal of idols. Here's what we like to do in the church today. Oh, I see that idol in so-and-so's life. Boy, they sure need to get that out of their life. Oh, did you see what so-and-so did over there? Woo, man, that's bad. You know what I found is bad in the church? 
Bad is what somebody else does that you don't do. And then we want to gossip. And then we want to talk about our fellow man who's been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And we want to condemn them for their sin while we don't look at our sin. I'm preaching now. We just want to point out what everybody else is doing. We want to talk about abortion in Virginia. We want to talk about infanticide. We want to talk about gambling in Tunica. We want to talk about, I'm against all those things, folks. Hear me. But when we talk about that to the exclusion of talking about our gossip, talking about our shameful attitudes and actions, we have a false sense of righteousness that is a stench in the nostrils of Almighty God. And we wonder why revival tarries. And we wonder why the Holy Spirit's presence doesn't fall. And we wonder why we're not baptizing as many people as we used to baptize. And we wonder why we're not sharing like we used to be sharing. And we wonder, oh, it's all going to, going to the pit, right? God is not up in heaven trying to hold back his blessings. But God's Spirit flows through obedience to his word. You see, we are praying for revival in vain if we're not first willing to let revival begin in me. That's where revival starts. And what you see in this passage is revival taking place and a removal of those of those idols you also saw a revival of public worship there's a word there's a word in the bible for worship to god uh excuse me for focusing on god and it's worship some people think worship is a ritual in fact some of y'all are mad at tim because he introduced a new song this morning you didn't even focus on the words of the song that's the kind of attitude that will keep revival out of a church. Keep revival out of your life. You see, God wants our focus because God's focused on us. He's not asking for us to do anything that he hadn't first done in the first place. I mean, when you work this text, uh, 2 Chronicles 29, 21, the sin offering was sacrificed in the temple. What is that? In, in the Old Testament construct, that is the worship of God. If you look at 29... 24. You see, the burnt offering was sacrificed. What is that? It's the corporate worship of Almighty God. You look at 2 Chronicles 29, 31. A thank offering was offered. What does that mean? It was corporate worship by the people who were committed to the covenant relationship. Israel and Judah were called to come together to celebrate the Passover. In 2 Chronicles 30, verse 1, you see, vibrant corporate worship was not the outflow of the revival that was coming upon the people and consequently upon the land. That's why corporate worship is so important. I can worship God in my deer stand, preacher. You might can, but you're disobedient if you do it on Sunday. That's legalistic, no. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. That's in the book. If God can't bless you with a deer on Saturday, why do you think he's going to bless you with a deer on Sunday? You know, it's amazing how spiritual we get in a duck blind. Oh, God, if you'll bring one more by, one more. We get, we get, we get dedicated at the basketball game or the football game. Some of y'all are going to be calling out to the Lord for the Rams or the Patriots. Whatever. Worship begins to show itself. There's a revival of holy living, 2 Chronicles 30, 17 through 20. I'm not going to go into those verses, although there's a whole other sermon there. But there's just a revival of holy living, of righteousness. We want a scorecard, don't we? We want a scorecard of righteousness. 
tell me what I need to do and what I don't need to do so I can check the box. And if I check enough boxes, then I'll feel good about myself. My friend, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. You let the Holy Spirit be your guide. You let the Word of God speak truth to your life. And you just follow the dictates of the Spirit in your life and see what God does. Chronicles 32, 27 through 28, the Lord blessed with abundance. Oh, that's where we get all the money, right? <laughs> Can I tell you, the greatest, the greatest sign of the blessing of God in, in the Old Testament was not money. It was national sovereignty. You didn't want to be overrun by your neighbor. It was protection from forces of, of of other countries coming against you. God blessed with abundance. He protected the people. He blessed them. Henry Blackaby said, the immediate need for revival among God's people is life and death for our nation. Apparently, there are too many of us who simply don't believe, and there are far too few who sense the awful judgment that is to come if we don't see revival. We need to believe Christ's warning. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I'm not here today to be a Debbie Downer in your life. I'm here, I'm here to say, guys, we need to get right with God. And what that means for you may be very different than somebody else over here or somebody else over there or even your pastor but the reality is revival will never come unless the people of God bow before the throne of God in humility, repentance, contrition. Therefore, repent and return quickly to the Lord. That's real revival. Oh, dear God that it would happen, that it might begin with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for the challenges that we receive from your word. And God, I pray that we would have an overriding passion to be obedient to you in the ways in which you lead. And so, Lord, as we move into this time of invitation, I pray that if there's someone here outside of the grace of Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would call out to you and allow us to walk with them, encouraging them and helping them. Lord, if there are folks that you're calling into the fellowship of this church, I pray that today would be the day of their decision. Lord, if there's many of us who've come to know the Lord at this church, we've been baptized in the baptistry right behind me. We've been a part of this fellowship, but Lord, if there's something in our lives that's keeping us from revival, God, I pray that we'd come to this altar, we'd call on a minister, we'd get prayer, we would do whatever's necessary to surrender afresh and anew to the great work of Jesus Christ. And so Heavenly Father, this is a holy moment. Lord, I pray we don't have to wait till next week to have revival. I pray that it might begin even today, even in this moment, as we say yes to you. So, Lord, accomplish your good, pleasing, and perfect will among your people. In this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining our service at Millington First Baptist Church. I'm Pastor David, and we're honored that you took time to worship with us today. Our goal is to lift up the name of Jesus and to proclaim his word as we call people to a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. If God is working in your life and bringing you to a point of decision, whether it means to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to become a part of our church family, or just to rededicate and repurpose your life to the things of God, we want to be there to help you. We have counselors available Monday through Friday during normal business hours that would love to talk with you, to pray with you, and to encourage you, even give you resources that will help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. So please call. We'll be there. We look forward to having a conversation with you. We thank you for worshiping with us. We look forward to seeing you next week as we lift up the name of Jesus and as we connect people to his love.